This video is about the process of dying and death. This is the final video of the developmental psychology playlist. Death is a developmental issue, since people think about death differently depending on what stage of life they're in. In the West, we have a tendency to deny death. People now usually die in a hospital as opposed to dying at home. We use euphemistic language like passed away to describe someone who has, well, passed away. And there's this persistent search for youth and beauty, for the appearance of youth and beauty. Rejection and isolation of the elderly has become commonplace, since people associate the elderly with death or dying. And thus we have a medical emphasis for uh, trying to prolong life. Certain terms to point out include grief, which is the emotional response to bereavement. Bereavement is the state of being deprived of someone by death. Mourning is the culturally determined expectations in the expression of grief. And dying is the perspective of the person who knows they are going to pass away soon. The emotional reactions and fears of the dying patient are also encompassed within this phrase. There are, of course, developmental differences, such as, for example, in pre-verbal children, they have a persistent search behavior prior to despair when a loved one is no longer there. This is similar to how adults respond to loss, according to Bowlby. Piaget, who stated or proposed object permanence, believed that dying is related to the disappearance of an object. So just as objects exist, but they can no longer be seen, some children may, who develop object permanence, believe the person is just gone away, but unable to, to be seen. There are seven types of infant reactions when introduced to significant separation. These include protest, yearning and searching, anger, despair, sadness, apathy, sadness and apathy, disturbances, and then finally they seek out new relationships. Children may reenact activities carried out with the lost caregiver. That is, if they've developed these internal representations and object permanence. There are games of hiding, disappearing, making things go on, and very young children seem to be able to notice uh, experiences that are related to death. In Piaget's pre-operational phase, or level one, which lasts from three to five years, Piaget stated that children engage in magical thinking and egocentricism. This is whereby they associate life with movement and death with stillness, and believe that only people who want to die, or who are quote-unquote bad, that they die. And they may confuse death with sleep. They believe that the dead can also be brought back to life. And if they find out that someone is actually dead, dead, well, they may blame themselves for, for what had happened. Level two is the pre-operational phase of concrete operations, which lasts from five to nine. And it is by then that children understand the irreversibility of death, but they see death as only happening to some people and that through your own will, you could luckily escape death. This is known as the avoidability of death. A majority of 10 to 12 year olds, however, still think that the dead can think and feel and experience. This is according to Bering and Bjorland, Bjorklund, 2004. Level three is uh, nine years of age and older or at the concrete operation stage, children understand the universality, finality which, of death, which results from internal or biological causes, the inevitability of death, whereby everyone dies and it cannot be avoided. Finally, level four is uh, formal operations, but for adolescents, uh, which occurs in adolescence, but it is still very egocentric. The prospect of death and aging seems very remote to them and also irrelevant because they are very young. However, they develop more abstract conceptions of death, they may hold on to more philosophical or religious views, and they might be relativistic or dialectical in their modes of thinking about death and dying. There are, unfortunately, children who experience terminal illness. And for them, they grow a systematic understanding of death. They understand the finality, inevitability, and completeness grasped in uh, dying and death. This shows a, a realistic shift in the time perspective, as they learn from changes in their own mortal condition and responses from those around them, observations of other ill children, etc, etc. Young children during then often become uh, hyper-aware that they are going to die, and experience a full range of emotions that adults who are also dying also experience. This reveals that emotions may manifest themselves in temper tantrums, or through drawing as opposed to the spoken word, or through pretend play. Adolescents who are coming to grips with death due to terminal illness, accident, or otherwise, may reflect on developmental concerns 
that they probably will never be able to experience, which includes thinking about the capacity to attract a partner, the capacity to make friends, to be accepted by peers, to be independent from their parents, as well as careers and life goals. Illness, of course, has an effect on their physical appearance and overall health. The adult understanding of death includes the biological causality in that it is either due to internal changes within the body or through external events that bring about internal change, like an accident. Consciousness about death intensifies during middle age since people then view half of their life as already gone. And thus, middle age adults fear death perhaps even more so than older adults who become used to thinking about death and dying more. Kubler-Ross proposed the stage theory of the process of dying in the late 60s and 70s. The first stage is denial, in which one resists reality, the reality of them dying, and clings to the memory or imagination that everything is okay. They run away from the stress. They usually pretend that there's a buffer that is protecting them from the unexpected news, and this allows time to mobilize less radical defenses. Denial exists in all patients at some stage, as some may believe themselves to be healthy. Next is anger, whereby an urge to change the reality as it enters consciousness occurs, in which denial can no longer be maintained. People may ask questions like, why me? Given time and attention, the patient, however, will simmer down. We no longer react in anger, and thus beginning the next stage, bargaining, which is a last desperate attempt to search for some way out of the unwanted reality that they are going to die. This includes usually finding an extension of life with a set deadline, like for example, a parent stating that they want to live until their daughter is married. This might occur in secret, or they may try and haggle or wrestle with God or a chaplain, or might try and grasp at straws, or find any other way to, to deal with the fact that they're going to die. The fourth stage in this stage theory is depression, whereby individuals no longer feel anger or rage, but rather it is replaced with a sense of great loss. They experience great sadness, apathy, which is allowed to enter present reality. There is a reactive depression, whether it be to nature of disease or the financial burden, and there's also a preparatory depression in which individuals prepare for the final separation from the world and loved ones. Meaning that they may say or begin to say their final goodbyes or they might try and isolate themselves from everyone else. In a way though, depression causes individuals to uh, take up stoicism, to become more resilient in their final time. Finally, there is acceptance, in which the individual is almost void of feelings and they have come at peace to knowing that they will die. They begin to lose interest in the outside world, having a disengagement, being no longer talkative, and people may start to feel separate from the dying individual. This is comparable to um, Erickson's uh, geotranscendence, which was a possible ninth stage, whereby one has accepted their fate and now is coming to be at peace, uh, um, coming to be at one with, with the universe or something like that. There is, however, an importance of hope during these five stages because that can drive people to either strive or find a cure, to hope that the individual will not die painfully, or to hope to be with others during the individual's final days. There are some positive uh, aspects of Kubler-Ross's theory. The theory actually sparked an interest in the area of death. It has some intuitive validity in that people who come to grief feel like this is these stages are probably happening to them, and it provides some understandable structure for this rather complex process. As a result, this has helped caregivers to attend to the emotional needs of patients and help the wider society to engage with death. There are, however, criticisms of Kubler-Ross's theory. It has not been uh, validated or empirically tested. There is an emphasis on stages, which assumes that there is some sort of normative pathway for adjusting to death. This, however, may not be the case. Some people may stay on one particular stage as opposed to another. As a result, this description of the process of dying becomes a prescription. There is some assumption that acceptance is the valued end of the dying process. This, however, may not necessarily be the case. And also there are individual differences or different disease pathways, as well as emotional changes which are unpredictable and may come about spontaneously since the individual is still trying to come to grips with death. There is a complex and ever-changing interplay of your emotions, according to Schneidman. The universality of this theory is also in question because for one, people don't necessarily die the same way. It could be from disease or murder or so on and so forth. And number two, different cultures, different 
ethnicities, different religious systems, different social support services, and different individuals react, well, differently to the dying process, and they also cope very differently. Stroebi et al. 2006 proposed an integrative risk framework of bereavement, whereby aspects in models have mixed support, whereby a more complex pathway is detailed, such as bereavement, which is affected by, well, the stress of, the stress of life, and stress that individuals are going to die. There is also inter- and non-personal risk factors, such as, as mentioned before, religious practices, cultural setting, dynamics of the family, uh, material resources, and so on. There's also intrapersonal risk factors, such as the individual's religious belief, their intellectual capacity, their style of attachment, their personality, uh, their socioeconomic status, their gender, whether they have had predispositions to certain vulnerabilities like uh, mental health issues, cancer, medical disorders, uh, substance abuse, their age. There is also appraisal and coping, whereby there are cognitive behavioral processes or mechanisms that are involved in helping to deal with the dying process. And then finally there's the outcome, which includes whether the person will be socially disengaged from everyone else, whether they've come to grips with the feeling of with dying, and yeah, their grief, whether they'll grieve or feel a loss. Other things to consider include the socio-historical context, such as age group to whom it most often happens, where the dying takes place, whether in the house or in the hospital, the increasing complexity of defining when someone is truly dead, because now we have uh, life support machines that could support processes indefinitely, like the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, Stu cannot really define whether someone is brain dead. There is also terrorism whereby it has made death more unpredictable, thus anyone could die at any point in time. But then we also have to account for the many advances that have taken place for prior to medicine and vaccines. Many children, well, many infants died. Kastenbaum in 2000 proposed challenges for developmental psychologists with respect to death. And basically this research has stated that there is more to the human encounter when with death than just using measures or self-report questionnaires and routine stage theories. One needs to actually engage with the depth which human relationships are going through during the dying process. And we need to stop compartmentalizing death and stop trivializing this process. And also we have to stop treating this as a mental illness because coming to grips with death is normal. Thank you for watching all these many videos I made about developmental psychology. In summary, we looked at the dying process and death, how people of different ages react to death or perceive death, the five stages of coming to grips with death, according to Kubler-Ross, strengths and weaknesses of that theory, the final uh, bereavement theory. And yeah, thanks for watching this video.